it's time for part 13 of A Family Apart. As you recall, Megan smiled cautiously. I've always been plain. Maybe people are kinder in the West. Catherine chuckled. You're a lovely young lady. You just haven't noticed. In any case, the Browders arrived in town to get supplies, heard about the orphan train, and came to, to this meeting. As soon as they saw you, they wanted you. Catherine paused. I know them well. They'll love you, and you'll love them. Frances leaned back in her chair, relieved. If Catherine spoke for them, then they must be good people. Do they live near here? Megan asked, her, wide, her eyes wide with hope. That's a problem. Catherine said. They live many miles west of here in Kansas territory. It would mean you'd be far from your brothers and sisters. You might see some of your family only once a year or so when the Browders come to St. Joe for supplies and bring you with them. You do have a choice, Megan. You can go with the Browders or wait to see if another couple asks for you. Megan climbed stiffly from her chair, her face paler than before. She turned to Francis and whispered, What can I hope for? I've always been a bad luck penny. No, you're not, Francis insisted. But Megan had taken Catherine's hand. I'll go with them, she said. The Browders were hurrying to the platform. Catherine introduced them to Megan. Mrs. Browder laughed with delight. There is so much I want to learn about you, she said to Megan. Do you like books? Do you like to read? Megan blushed and glanced once more at Francis. I'm not much at reading, ma'am, she repeated hesitantly. Francis ached for her sister. She knew how hard it would be for Megan to tell her new parents that she had always busied herself with chores, never learning to read. But Mrs. Browder reached out and pulled Megan into her hug. If you can't read, I'll teach you, she said. You'll learn to love books as much as I do. Frances couldn't speak. She knew she could give strength to Megan, but her throat was choked with tears, so she helplessly shook her hand and shook her head. There will be time for goodbyes later, Catherine said. Megan, let's find a spot for you and the Browders to talk to one another, she pointed. Look, back there, I see some empty chairs. Megan, her face tight with misery, walked hand in hand with Mrs. Browder to the back of the room. Frances was glad for Megan's sake. She could tell the Browders were kind people. Mrs. Browder looked at Megan as though she were a wonderful Christmas gift, so Megan would have a good home. In spite of herself, Frances felt her eyes fill with tears. How could she bear to part from her shy, loving sister, who had always been her dearest friend? Many of the children had already left the platform when little Clara her chin jutting out in determination, climbed down from her chair and marched to the front of the platform. To Francis' surprise, Clara faced the audience and shouted at the top of her lungs, Doesn't anybody want to adopt me? A red-cheeked woman, as round as an apple, called, I do! Oh dear little Lipcomb, I do! and raced toward the platform, clutching her shawl around her with one hand and tugging her surprised husband behind her with another. She enfolded Clara with such enthusiasm that all Frances could see of Clara as she was carried away was her wobbly hair bow and her high-buttoned shoes. Frances glanced to each side and felt her cheeks grow warm again. She, Petey, and Mike were the only ones left in the front row, and very few children were still seated in the second row. What would happen if they weren't chosen? Would they have to go back? Back to whom? The mother who didn't want them? These two are great questions. What do you think are the answers? Share with your fellow listeners. The sudden sharp memory of the judge telling Mike he'd have to go to Tombs Prison if he ever returned to New York City made her gasp aloud. Someone had to take Mike. There was a slight commotion near the double doors as a rotund family, mother, father, and son, pushed their way into the room. 
The sun was scowling as they entered, and the man's expression as he looked up at the platform became a matching scowl. I told you to hurry or we'd be late, he loudly complained to his wife. Look, all the older, stronger boys have been chosen. Francis shivered, wishing that these awful people would turn and leave. She didn't like them. Andrew suddenly spoke to Francis. She swung to see a tall, pleasant-faced couple standing beside him. Frankie, he said, I'd like you to meet Jake and Margaret Cummins. They'd like you to come and live with them. Francis's arms tightened around Petey and she gulped back disappointment and frustration. Here at last were people who wanted her and she had to turn them down. Her throat was suddenly so dry and tight that it hurt to speak. Thank you, she whispered to the Cumminses. But I can't accept your kindness. I must stay with my little brother. Mrs. Cummings smiled and took a step forward. We didn't make it clear. We want both of you, little Peter, too. Petey squirmed, trying to break Francis' strong grip. My name is Petey, he said. We live close to the Missouri border and Kansas Territory, not far from St. Joseph, Mr. Cummings said. He added to Petey, we have a farm with cows and horses. Petey pushed himself upright, near, nearly falling off Francis's lap. Horses to ride? he asked. That's right. With a frantic wiggle, Petey managed to jump from Francis's lap. He took Mr. Cummins' hand. I would like to ride a horse, he said. Then so you shall, Mr. Cummings said, answered. Mrs. Cummings answered, smiled at Francis. I'm afraid that my husband wants the two of you to come with us so much that he's not above using a bit of bribery. Please, Frankie, will you come with us? Yes, Francis said quietly. Mike, she thought. What will I do about Mike? But she had Petey to think of, too. Thank you, she remembered to tell the Cummingses. Then suppose you find a spot to talk together, Andrew began. He was interrupted by the family who had arrived late. The man slapped a pudgy hand on Andrew's shoulder, forcibly turning him. That boy, he said, pointing at Mike. We want to take him. What are you thinking right now about Mike's future with this obnoxious family? Share what you think with your fellow listener. Francis, who had jumped from the platform, whirled to look at Mike. He was the only child left of those who had come on the orphan train. His face was red with embarrassment, and Francis knew he was holding back tears with great difficulty. Her heart breaking, Francis took a step toward Mike, but the fat woman pushed between them. Francis saw a frown draw Andrew's eyebrows together. Mr. and Mrs. Friedrich, he said, you understand that these children are to be treated like family members. They are not to be used as hired hands. Of course, of course, Mrs. Friedrich said. He'll be another son to us. We'll give the boy good food. She smiled and glanced quickly at her husband. The boy needs only some good food to make him grow tall and strong. Our own son works beside me on our farm. I will not ask more of the boy than of my son. But it makes no matter. We have been approved by the committee, Mr. Friedrich stated, as though that should settle it. He asked Mike, What is your name, boy? Michael Kelly, sir, Mike said. Mr. Friedrich turned to Andrew. Where are the papers we are to sign? It is almost a two-hour ride back to our farm. We don't want to waste any time. But Andrew looked carefully at Mike. Do you want to go with them, Mike? He asked. It's your choice. Francis listened for his answer as intently as Andrew did. Mike looked about him at the otherwise empty platform and Francis could see that he tried to put on a brave face. 
It seems to be my only choice, Mr. McNair, he said. Yes, I'm game for it. Frankie, are you coming? Mrs. Cummings put a hand on Francis's shoulder, urging her toward where Mr. Cummings and Petey were waiting. Uh, yes, ma'am, just one minute, please, she said. She squeezed past Mrs. Friedrich to reach Mike and hugged him. Go with them, only if you really want to, she whispered. It couldn't be as bad as if I'm sent back, he mumbled against her ear. They don't seem like very kind people. Have you ever known me not to be able to hold my own? He pulled away, squared his shoulders, and attempted a smile. You can say goodbye later, Andrew reminded them, so Francis reluctantly let go of her brother's hand and followed Mr. Cummings. All of us have homes, just as Ma wanted, Francis thought. But she gave a glance back at Mike, hoping his new family would turn out to be better people than she guessed them to be. The next few minutes were a blur of new faces, voices, and papers to sign. Then Catherine and Andrew came to stand in front of Francis. Catherine and I will stop by the Cummings' farm in a few days, Andrew told her. Some small tools Jake ordered haven't come in. They're due on the next steamboat from St. Louis. Catherine interrupted. We'll deliver them ourselves. It will be a good excuse for a visit. I'll be so glad to see you, Frances blurted out to Andrew before she thought. She tried hard not to blush at her eagerness. And so will we, Margaret Cummings said and explained to Frances. We're all very good friends. Catherine gave Frances a folded sheet of paper. I wrote down your brother's and sister's addresses, and I've given them yours. You can keep in touch with them by letter until the next time you meet. She held out a hand to Francis. Mr. Friedrich is eager to get back to his farm, so now would be a good time for you children to say goodbye to one another. Peg dashed toward her and Francis dropped to her knees to throw her arms around her littlest sister. I want you to come too, Peg cried. I can't love, Peg whispered against her hair, but you'll have Danny. The two of you will be together. Danny squeezed them both so tightly it was painful. I know how much you're hurting inside, Francis told him, told him, and I'm proud of you, Danny. Danny's body shook in a long, deep shudder, and she could tell he was fighting back tears. Megan ran to them, wrapping her arms around Francis's neck. I'll miss you so terribly much, she cried as she clung to Francis. I'll be all alone. No. No, you won't, Francis murmured. You'll have the fine people you'll be going with. They'll take good care of you. You won't be alone. But I won't be with you. Oh, Megan, Francis cried. She shut her eyes against the burning pain of tears she refused to shed. Write to me, she said, and I'll write to you. I can't write, Megan wailed. Francis quickly soothed her, but you'll learn. Now you'll have a reason to learn. Your, your new mother will help you, and until you do, she'll read my letters to you and... Megan burst out. I don't want a new mother. Oh, Francis, can't we go home? There's a little more in a moment, but right now, share what you are feeling about where the Kelly children are going with your fellow listeners. were a slap that shook sensibility back into Francis. She straightened. No, she said. Face the truth, Megan. We can't. Megan stopped crying and blinked at Francis, who sounded so bitter she startled herself. Megan, Francis said more softly. Megan, you know what I meant. But Mike rushed to hug them, and Francis could feel the sobs that shook his body. Peg began to whimper, and Petey wailed. Danny clung to Mike and cried, What will I do without you, Mike? Mike just shook his head, snuffling and trying to smile at Danny. You'll do just fine, my lad, he said. Better than ever without me. 
Danny shook his head as though he didn't believe those words any more than Mike did. What about you, Mike? he asked. How will things work out for you? He glanced suspiciously at the Friedrichs, and Frances knew that she wasn't the only one who was concerned about what kind of home they'd make for Mike. We'll find out what kind of a home they'll make for Mike and so much more as a family apart continues. Thank you.